Hello, and thanks for joining us for the March edition of Stratford Talks, our monthly podcast that takes you deep into discussions on geopolitics and security issues. I'm Ben Sheen. And I'm Marla Moore, and we're your hosts for the show. We have two parts to the show today. First, Eugene Chosovsky will join us to discuss the latest events in Ukraine and the outlook in that conflict between Russia and the West. And second, East Asia analyst Thomas Vien will share some insights into what appears to be a spate of foreign renditions by Chinese authorities. We'll leave you with a glimpse inside the Strap 4 mailbag, so be sure to stick around. Don't forget, if you have feedback, questions, or ideas for a podcast topic, drop us a line at strat4.com slash podcast slash feedback. You can also follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, where our handle is at Strap4. And now, on with the show. It's been two years now since Ukraine was thrown into turmoil by the Euromaidan uprising, the series of protests that culminated in the ouster of then-President Viktor Yanukovych, followed shortly thereafter by Russia's takeover of the Crimean Peninsula. And nothing between Moscow and the West has been the same since. And nothing's been the same in Kiev either, where it's been hard for a reconstituted Ukrainian government to get its feet on the ground. But the domestic politics and the international issues are closely tied together. Eurasia analyst Eugene Chazowski, one of Stratfor's analysts covering the former Soviet region, joins us now to explain what to expect from the region for the coming year. So Eugene, a lot has happened in those two years since Euromaidan took place. In some ways, we've seen uh, an emerging stalemate between Russia and the West, and in other areas, we've seen some degree of movement. Can you give us a quick rundown on what exactly we've seen over the previous two years that leads us up to uh, this current situation now? So basically, since the Euromaidan uprising in Kiev a couple of years ago, there was a quick series of quite dramatic events that took place, first of which was the formation of a new government in Ukraine, which aligned itself towards the West and away from Russia. Following that, we saw Russia essentially come into Crimea and annex the peninsula. And then immediately after that, a series of pro-Russian protests broke out in eastern Ukraine, which has now evolved into this sort of stalemate conflict between pro-Russian forces on the one hand uh, that advocate for the separatism of these territories and Ukrainian forces on the other hand, which are trying to basically get them back into the Ukrainian state. And so what happened over the first few months kind of set the tone for the last two years, which is essentially the continued conflict in eastern Ukraine and a series of negotiations that are taking place between Russia and the West and Ukraine uh, over all of these various issues. Well, there's been a lot of diplomatic movement over the course of the last two years trying to resolve that. And I'm sure that for many of our listeners, that diplomacy isn't necessarily always easy to follow. Can you describe what's involved in what we commonly refer to as the Minsk agreements and whether or not those are workable? So the Minsk agreements essentially entail both a political and security uh, aspect to ending the conflict in eastern Ukraine. From the security component, it would be essentially a a ceasefire to all hostilities between the separatists and between the Ukrainian security forces. Following that, there would be a pull out of heavy weaponry and then essentially uh, the restoration of Ukraine's border, the separatist territory's border uh, to Ukrainian control. Now, that is all contingent upon, at least from the eyes of Moscow, the political component of Minsk, which entails essentially granting greater autonomy toward the separatist territories. Uh, It entails having them uh, go back into the Ukrainian state in some form. The problem is that there is not an agreement over what that form will take. And an even more problematic issue is that the timing of the political and the security components are not agreed to between the various sides. Now, in addition to the Minsk agreements as well, we've also got the Normandy talks taking place. Can you explain a little bit about what those are, Eugene? Sure. So the Normandy talks are essentially between two European countries, Germany and France, as well as Ukraine and Russia. And so the representatives of of these four countries frequently meet to discuss sort of the higher level political aspects of the Ukraine conflict. So whereas Minsk deals with the more tactical elements, uh, deals with the actual fighting on the ground and deals with the the more specific detail of the conflict, the Normandy talks are essentially about dealing with the kind of broader uh, understanding between Russia and the West over what the future of Ukraine will look like. Well, and if all of that isn't complex enough for you to follow, we also have politics going on within Kiev itself, which are domestic Ukrainian politics, and those seem to be in a bit of disarray lately. 
Absolutely. Essentially, the government that came into power uh, following the Euromaidan uprising is led by two key figures, one of which is the president, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko, and the other is the prime minister, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who the, the two of them kind of as a tandem came in to lead the post-Euromaidan uh, political system of, of Ukraine. Obviously, there's other players as well, but these are the two main figures. Now, over the course of the past year, uh, the Ukrainian Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, he has come under fire from a lot of different ang- uh, from a lot of different sides, essentially because of he is the champion behind Ukraine's austerity measures, which are key for Ukraine to get financial assistance from the West, primarily in the form of the IMF package. Um, he has also been involved with a lot of the reforms in the legal and the judicial sector, and from the perspective of many different people, he has not been doing enough. Um, or in some cases, too much. For example, in terms of the negotiations with the separatist territories, some of the more far right, some of the more ultra-nationalist uh, segments of Ukrainian society think that Ukraine has basically given too many concessions. On the other hand, he's facing pressure from groups that think that he's uh, not doing enough. So his party and his, and, his, and his own personal popularity has basically plunged over the past year, and he barely survived a no-confidence vote last week, which means that he gets to stay in power, but his his base at this point is quite weak. It's always sort of a catch-22 for any Ukrainian politician, given that there are such deep historical divisions within the territory that we today think of as Ukraine. Historically, it's been riven between European empires and Russia on the one side, and those divisions have never really gone away despite its uh, post-Soviet independence. That's absolutely right. And Ukraine is a polarized country on a normal day, uh, basically between the, the more Western-leaning center, so Kiev and the Western parts of the country, whereas traditionally the Eastern part of Ukraine and, and Southern Ukraine, especially Crimea, uh, were, were kind of more Russian-leaning. But these divisions, this polarization has only been exacerbated by the fact that Russia on the one hand and the West, meaning the U.S. and the EU, play into these divisions in order to get uh, an advantage against the other side. Because Ukraine is located in such a strategic place, you know, on the northern European plain, there's very little geographic barriers within Ukraine. Uh, It's basically sought after by both Russia and the West. And so this has kind of inflamed the divisions that already existed for Ukraine long before the conflict broke out, but it's just become much more, uh, it's become much, much more extreme now. And it's interesting because we've really seen an expression of Russian will in Ukraine. And there's a number of factors in which this has played out. Because the Russians are being quite crafty in a number of levels. They understand that actually by Kiev being politically unstable, that plays to Moscow's favor. So clearly that they're doing what they can to make sure that that the government in in Ukraine doesn't really reach an even keel. And then in examples like Crimea, we've seen the uh, the Russians go as far as to actually take unilateral military action to annex that landmass. And then on top of this, we've seen the Russians backing the pro-Russia separatists in the eastern reaches of of Ukraine. On top of this, they're they're playing a lot of negotiating angles with both the US, European countries, and and now we've seen an extension into Syria. So it seems like Ukraine is actually, it's influencing a huge amount of Russian foreign policy at the moment. Absolutely. As you mentioned, there's so many overlapping aspects to this conflict. First, you have the sort of internal conflict, as we've been talking about, between Ukraine and, and the separatist forces. Uh, then on top of that, you have the larger conflict between Russia and the West. And then you have this more sort of global aspect of the, the competition between Russia and the West, which includes theaters like Syria. And so in, in this negotiation process that we talked about earlier, especially things like the Minsk talks and the Normandy talks and the various bilateral negotiations that happen, there's definitely a connection between what's going on in Ukraine to what's going on in Syria. So, for example, the the sanctions that the West has passed against Russia, certainly Moscow wants to see those lifted. And that can be even seen, Russia's involvement in that conflict can be seen partially, at least, as wanting to get leverage over the West, um, as wanting to have basically a chip in which to bargain with the West. 
And so all of these negotiation processes are interlinked, and that makes them all the more complicated. Well, if we were just to unwind those threads a little bit more, because it's very easy to look at Ukraine and Russia and and the West and, and just see sort of this big tangled ball of politics. But untangling that just a little bit might look like really examining why Ukraine matters so much to Russia. And geopolitically, we've talked in the past about that being part of its its buffer zone, that it really needs that kind of strategic standoff territory uh, between Russia proper and the forces of NATO and Europe on the one side that it views as uh, enemies, rivals, <laughs> for lack of a better word, things that Russia tries to protect itself from historically. But on the other hand, is it really in Russia's best interest to have a frozen conflict with the West on its border right there? It depends. If Ukraine is Western leaning, which it is right now, which it has been at various points uh, in its history, and especially in its most recent post-Soviet history, we've seen the Ukrainian government sort of flip between Russia and then that government is voted out or there's a, a revolution and then it goes towards the West. Um, so right now we're in, a, we're in a place where Ukraine is very much pro-Western. There is an active conflict going on with Russia, so that makes them, uh, the government at least, quite uh, anti-Russian. And so it's in Russia's interest, ultimately, that Ukraine is at least a neutral, is at least a neutral buffer state, meaning that it's not aligned with the West, especially militarily, but also economically and politically. And so when there's a government in place like there is right now, which is actively hostile towards Russia, which is actively seeking to integrate with the West, Russia uses a conflict like Eastern Ukraine, uh, keeping that conflict at least somewhat simmering um, as a lever against the government in Kiev. If it can't switch the government if it, because it's not in a position to basically overthrow the government in Kiev at this point, then basically doing whatever it can to undermine that government, whether it is in the conflict in eastern Ukraine, whether it's about uh, trade restrictions, whether it's about political manipulation, that right now is in Russia's interest. If by some, by some measures the Ukrainian government changes its orientation or something happens where the, the strategic calculus shifts, then that might actually make Russia less interested in the frozen conflict. But as things stand right now, that does play into Russia's interest. So Eugene, playing it forward, what do you think the next move is in Ukraine for the Russians? They've obviously annexed Crimea, but what will their next moves be? Well, I would say that Russia right now is in a fairly weak position. I mean, not only in Ukraine, which is basically lost essentially to the West as the government shifted uh, its orientation, uh, but also its economy has suffered heavily, uh, mostly because of the low price of oil, but also because of the sanctions that have been passed against it because of the Ukrainian conflict. So certainly Russia wants to do something in Ukraine, and, and clearly what it did in Crimea and what it's currently doing in eastern Ukraine uh, plays into Russia's need to make sure that Ukraine is neutral, or at the very least it's undermined if it's pro-Western. But in far, as far as going beyond that, I think that it's safe to say that if Russia was planning something major, for example, a major military move uh, into other parts of Ukraine or perhaps other parts of Eastern Europe, it would have already done so. Uh, but because Russia's ability to project power at this point militarily, economically, uh, and even politically is weakened, I think it's, it's essentially a wait and see game for Russia. Right now, they have the lever in eastern Ukraine, which they can continue to use to bleed the Ukrainian state to hope that maybe the, the unpopularity of the current government will somehow uh, eventually turn into its favor. Um, other than that, they have other areas that they can look to, uh, other, other countries along the former Soviet periphery that are more aligned with Russia, countries like Belarus, countries like Armenia. And then there's the conflict in Syria, which, as we talked about before, is also part of the negotiation process. So it's a multifaceted game, uh, multifaceted game for Russia. But at this point, it's, it's options for serious movement on Ukraine in terms of getting it back into its orbit is rather limited. I guess the question that I would ask Eugene is, you know, you've made this comparison recently to Ukraine sort of occupying the same position as Germany did during the Cold War as that that very militarized flashpoint between Russia and the West. That scenario ultimately didn't turn out so well for Russia, though, or for the Soviet region, I should say, uh, primarily due to finances and a weakened hand. 
That's absolutely correct. And if we look at the situation right now, essentially, there's a lot of differences, obviously, between the Cold War era and what and the era that we're in right now. But essentially, the, the underlying dynamics behind it, the, that kind of clash between Russia and the West in the European continent, that's still there, but it's shifted several hundred, if not thousand miles uh, to the east. And so that can be seen as, as essentially a strategic retreat from Russia. Obviously, the Soviet Union, when it collapsed, that, that was a very difficult time for Russia. Uh, eventually, it was able to regain some of its stature and, and sort of reemerge as a regional power. But now that's a threat once again with this conflict in Ukraine. So Russia has always been worried about the, the expansion of the EU and especially of NATO into its what it calls its near abroad or its, its sphere of privileged interests. And that certainly happened over the past couple of decades. Now, whether this continues and whether the, whether countries like Ukraine, you know, Moldova, Georgia join the EU or join NATO, I don't think that's necessarily a, a concern right now because, I mean, these countries are at least a decade away, if not longer, from actually joining this bloc. But the fact is that they're now oriented more towards the West and being supported more from political, economic, and security elements by the West. And so, in that sense, there are some similarities with the Cold War, but it's also quite different as well. Well, I think uh, one thing that's certainly clear here is that this is simply another chapter in the, the book of history that, that's being written about Ukraine, and certainly we haven't seen the end note yet, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out over the, the coming year. Eugene, thank you so much for taking the time to talk through what is quite uh, a complicated situation, but thank you for unraveling this for us today. Thank you, it was my pleasure. For our next segment, we're turning now to China, where President Xi Jinping has been waging a significant anti-corruption drive over the course of the past year. Now, this is part of a wider effort to restore the legitimacy of the Communist Party in the eyes of the people. There's been an interesting new twist on that front, though. Over the last few months, a number of Chinese citizens living abroad, including some with dual nationalities, mysteriously went missing. And it's notable that five of these people all worked for a publishing house in Hong Kong that Beijing has identified as a political problem. Thomas Vien, one of Stratfor's East Asia analysts, is here now to shed some more light on that issue. So, Thomas, you've said that this series of disappearances and a handful of others seem to suggest a policy of renditions by the Chinese government. Can you tell us more about what led you to that conclusion? One of the big shifts in this is that whatever Chinese intelligence has been accused of in the past, they have not really been known for trying to conduct kidnappings or conduct uh, assassinations abroad. So what's really changed is that you see people disappearing beyond China's own borders, and then they soon reappear in China, and then you can't explain how they got there, just that they're there. They soon get aired on state media making some sort of confession. So what this tells us is that this isn't just one or two people that get overzealous and grab someone. This is something that's been targeted. This has been across cities across borders, and it suggests unity of thought. Where have these disappearances been occurring from? So as far as the five booksellers, we see three employees that disappeared while they were in China. But the two really interesting ones are one from Hong Kong, where although Hong Kong is a Chinese territory, uh, the Ministry of State Security, China's intelligence service, is prohibited from operating due to the special conditions of Hong Kong. The second was from Thailand, where this fellow was visiting a resort, and then he disappeared back to China to answer for some crime he supposedly committed over 10 years ago. And then in addition to these, we've seen what may or may not be renditions, also in Myanmar, an attempt to kidnap or kill the brother of a high-level um, Chinese official that went down for corruption, who's thought to hold nuclear and uh, party secrets. It sounds as though you think there might be a wider pattern of renditions underway that's not yet proven. I think this is actually a very interesting question because when we say wider, wider relative to what? The reason that this has garnered notice is that this was something that hadn't happened very much in the past at all, full stop. I think it's still too early to tell if it's going to keep widening because what we've seen in the past is that China has tried to get people overseas back, fugitives that are running away from corruption and taking state assets with them, for example. China's been very intent on using what are more or less legal means to get these people back. They send uh, overt police inspectors to over 56 foreign countries, and they make a very big show of marching these fellows onto the planes and off of the planes uh, and saying that this is rule of law, that this is them being entirely legitimate 
in how they get people back. What's different is that this no longer appears to be a very big concern. And what this suggests to me is that they haven't really gone to change up the methods as far as uh, the norms. I don't believe that what we will see is them moving from these overt um, overt bringbacks of fugitives abroad to uh, just you know throwing all of them in sacks and stuffing them into vans and bring them to China. And I believe that this is because that they do recognize that there is some sort of cost, that you do get blowback, that you do sacrifice a lot of these long-term political objectives just by doing this and you know not really making a show of hiding it. And what this tells me is that there is some underlying need to borderline publicize these renditions that outweighs the need to project this image of legitimacy. And you raise a good point there, Thomas, because extraordinary rendition has been used for a long time by governments across the world. You know, specifically this government sponsored abduction and then transfer of personal persons from one country to another. I guess the question I have is why now for China? What's really pushing Beijing to, to force this agenda at this time? And also, what do they gain by having it so widely publicized? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, the US, insofar as the US conducts this sort of thing, they're usually not too keen to talk about it. But I think that what we see in China right now is that there is an intense political struggle going on, and that uh, Xi Jinping feels that his own power, of his own faction may, or may be at some sort of risk. Uh, this comes because that in 2017, the Chinese Communist Party will hold a party congress. This will basically de decide the appointments of people from the very top all the way down to the very bottom. Everyone's going to move up. Everyone wants their network to move up. And there are people that are worried about what Xi Jinping will do if he has five more years and he's secure in power that will want to knock out his friends, will want to knock out his, his allies, and if not necessarily unseat him, at least cut his wings a little bit. And what we've noticed is that when Xi goes after his opponents, one of the biggest things that he levels at them is that they're bad people. They're corrupt. They take lots and lots of money. They have several mistresses. And this last point is something that's really been able to stick. And if you look at these renditions of the five booksellers, the interesting thing is that while the Chinese government might have something against Hong Kong's publishing houses, which publish anything ranging from gossip column trash to uh, high-level political leaks from competing factions in Beijing, this particular publishing house, Causeway Bay Books, has been prepared to publish a book that purportedly deals with Xi Jinping's love life. And this might be mistresses, this might be previous girlfriends, we're not entirely sure, but it seems that someone at the very top felt that this was very unhelpful for uh, their prospects in 2017. And then after picking up these booksellers, what's essentially happened with the two highest level ones, the ones that actually ho hold uh, foreign passports, has been that they are put on state media and then they, they basically read off some formulated confession. And what this suggests to me is that there is an intended audience. It's certainly not, you know, foreign countries where they won't be convinced by this sort of confession. No one's going to believe that um, this guy left Thailand and just crossed borders without being seen just so he could confess to a, a sort of crime that he, or, he may or may not have committed 10 years ago. The real audience is probably domestic. And I think that this is why China, unlike the U.S., has really not made any serious attempt to hide it at all. Well, you know, it's really interesting. This question of timing has a lot of different aspects to it because, I mean, certainly for uh, Xi Jinping, to the idea that someone would write an expose of his love life in sort of a Clinton-esque sort of a vein would certainly be embarrassing. But you also had to take a step back and look at what is the real struggle for legitimacy that the Communist Party is facing in China right now, and that is intimately tied to the economy and the faltering economy more so. It, the the legitimacy of the party is tied to the idea of um, ever expanding growth and guaranteed employment for life and a number of other social contract types of issues with the Chinese people, which it can no longer guarantee in the same way. So I think that the the concept we have to move away from is legitimacy per se. I think that that has been something that's very important to the Communist Party, and it is still important to the Communist Party. But what I think is coming out here is that it's become no longer about just legitimacy, just about delivering on these promises. It's become about survival, just this 
very cutthroat struggle to get to the top and stay at the top. And in this struggle, it's like Game of Thrones, you win or you die. And I think that this is what's driven some, some of this sort of erratic behavior. This is what's sort of driven this sort of lawlessness that gives the impression of anything but legitimacy that we're seeing now. And as the economy worsens, the tie-in is that this pressures individual politicians. This makes that survival for uh, survival just that more intense, even as legitimacy falters. And it's interesting because we are naturally going to try and view this through a very Western prism coming from this democratic perspective where we have freedom of speech. And, you know, the fact that you can suppress your people and potentially abduct them and, and play, use them as pawns effectively is very unpalatable. But certainly for the Chinese, they have a completely different outlook on this, don't they? That's correct. And I think that we need to just step back a moment and see that it's not just about booksellers and Xi Jinping. It's about the party in China and China's relationship with its own citizens and its citizens abroad. What we see is that it's not just about protecting Xi Jinping, it's also about making sure that you have these overseas communities of Chinese, these exiles that may have fled China and taken um, secrets with them, that they know that they need to stay low, be quiet, that they do not need to be taking part in these high-level power struggles because that's what can hurt the party and that's what the party wants to deter. Well, it's very interesting, as you pointed out, the renditions themselves are new behavior on the part of China's intelligence services. We've seen them so far in Thailand and Hong Kong, as well as in China proper. So far, it would appear that they're taking place in China's near abroad. Is there a risk that they might extend further afield? I think that that's already here. And I think that it happens a lot in the near abroad because these are areas that are well within China's grasp. These are areas that have very, very close economic ties with China. I mean, really, what place doesn't? But geography plays a huge, huge role in this. However, as I noted before, there was a report that Chinese agents have actually attempted to capture or kill this um, defector. And that took place in the US. This is maybe a failed case, but it shows that the intent is there, that really borders aren't the huge issue. It almost seems as if there's something kind of uh, insidious at play here. Well, I say insidious. It's, you know, there was a very specific statement from uh, Beijing which expressed concern about the, the poisoning of the hearts and minds of the youth, which I kind of always thought that was rock and roll's job. But there is a point here that younger generations generally sort of move in a more progressive direction, often to their forebears. And that is of real concern to the Chinese establishment. If you're trying to preserve, you know, what is left of the communist establishment, sort of youthful diversity is not necessarily going to pull in the same direction. So it's interesting to think that by being able to have this global reach, being able to reach out and pluck people away wherever they might be, that's a pretty useful intimidation tool and tactic when it comes to actually keeping your vast overseas population in line. Right, that's, that's correct. And I think that it has had the effect of intimidating people. What we've read before is that there used to be a very, very vibrant exile community in Thailand, where thoughts are shared freely, where people fleeing from the regime could basically go and hide and have a community to belong to. Those people don't talk to each other anymore. There have been many reports that there are very strange Chinese men following them around whose mannerisms reflect that of secret police back in China. And the Chinese Ministry of State Security is said to be one of the better intelligence services out there. I find it very hard to believe that they would keep getting seen if they didn't want to be seen. We've also seen that there's this intimidation effect on Hong Kong's publishing houses. A few of them have recently closed in the wake of these renditions. And the reason that this is so important is, as you mentioned, Ben, that the youth are going to be the next leaders, or they can become the problems for the next leaders. So you really don't want this dynamic where there are releases of um, information abroad that are not very friendly to the party. The youth go abroad and soak it up, and they bring it back into China where it could foment discontent. And I think that we can't just see this as renditions. This is also a new initiative of their propaganda department. It sounds like a chilling effect on freedom of thought and expression in uh, vast pockets of the world where there's a large Chinese this constituency. Is, this is comprehensive. It's not just the stick of the threat of renditions. This is also their publications. 
Xi Jinping recently completed a tour of top Chinese state media organizations in which he exhorted them to expand their international presence abroad, among other things. And we're seeing this manifest in other areas as well, such as China's expanding cyber capability, because clearly now so much communication is done online. And actually, Beijing is taking huge steps to control not only what comes into the country, but also the communications of Chinese nationals across the, the World Wide Web. That's correct, Ben. As this sort of crackdown on information flows increases, as state media takes, takes the fore and as independent media becomes restrained and people are less willing to talk, we really have to reassess how we view the information coming out of China. Thomas, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to share this with us, this very interesting perspective on China and how to read between the lines of these political contests that are underway in Beijing. So we really appreciate it. My pleasure, Marla. Before we leave you today, we'll take a quick look inside the Stratfor mailbag and respond to a question from one of our subscribers. As many of you know, security expert Fred Burton has investigated a number of terrorist-related plane crashes, and he wrote recently about an explosion that took place aboard Delo flight D-159 over Savalia. Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for the explosion, which killed only one person and didn't actually succeed in bringing down the aircraft. Fred's recent article zeroed in on the question of why it's important to find the bomb maker and focus less on who claims responsibility for an attack. As he notes, the explosive device in this case involved military-grade TNT concealed inside an ordinary-looking laptop that made it through X-ray security systems in Mogadishu. Fortunately, the bomb exploded at low altitude after takeoff, but had the detonation occurred at high altitude, Fred says it likely would have caused a secondary blast in the aircraft's fuel tank and destroyed the plane entirely. One Strat4 subscriber wants to know, why is that exactly? And here's Fred Burton with the response. With the bombing of the aircraft out of Mogadishu at a low altitude range, you had a very tactical explosion that just punched a hole in the fuselage. But if that same device had detonated at, let's say, 30,000 feet, altitude and pressurization comes into play which would have broken that plane apart, you would have had a catastrophic terrorist attack that would have killed everybody on board. The higher the altitude, you're going to have an umbrella effect. If your listeners can envision an umbrella opening, that's what happened, for example, with the bombing of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. You have the plane explode, tail sections fall off, front section, and due to the velocity as that debris pattern starts to fall, you have it break up and disintegrate across miles or in some cases even countries. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you as always for listening and I hope you'll stay tuned until next month by following us at stratfor.com. You can get social media updates from our Facebook and Twitter feeds and you're always welcome to drop us a line at stratfor.com slash podcast slash feedback. Thanks for joining us everyone. Until next time. 